How you doing? How, how's UVU? I was, I was just with uh, Matt Holland and Senator Lee actually this morning, Mike Lee from Utah. And I like Matt Holland a lot, President Holland. Do you guys like him? Yeah. I think he's doing really good things here at UVU. I think it's an exciting time to be a, a student at UVU. Really, really like him and what he's doing here. I also love Shauna Theobald. Do you guys love her? She's great. Round of applause, please. Because you know she's leaving, right? Do you know this? Oh. Okay, she's leaving sometime. She has a service opportunity, and so she'll be leaving soon. She has been helping entrepreneurs. You probably don't know this. I'm 37 years old. What's the, is this, this class, young 20s? Young 20s, when I was your age, I was an entrepreneur at BYU, and Shauna helped me when I was your age. Even, you know, this is 15 years ago. No, this is 14 years ago. And um, I think she nominated me even for uh, the Young Entrepreneur of the Year in the state of Utah in 2001. And I won that because of her, I think. And so she has been helping entrepreneurs for a long time. So. You have great people here. Uh, they have your back. Shauna's awesome. I think President Holland's great. And uh, I like UVU. I'm getting to know it better. And uh, I've been here a couple times speaking, guest lecturing or whatever, and I th I've had a fun time. So I want this to be good for you guys. I don't, this isn't about me. I don't, this is about you. So I'm gonna kind of share some thoughts and ideas, but I'd like to have a little more interaction personally. If you have a question, raise your hand, like if it's burning right then, like if it's something I've said, let's just kind of go back and forth on questions and then we'll have some Q&A at the end as well. But I wanna just, I don't know what's really meaningful. I could talk a lot about entrepreneurship in a lot of different ways. And so if your questions or comments will kind of honestly help guide me. So if you do that for me, I'd love it. Um, so my name is Jeff Burningham. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I started my first company as an undergrad at BYU in 2001. In 2001, we won what was then called the business plan competition. It's now the business model competition, which is a slight difference. What's the difference between those two things, a business plan and a business model? The size. The what? The size, mainly. The size, okay. Maybe business plan is on paper and a business model is a physical thing that you create. Yeah. 14 years ago at BYU, we were writing this big business plan, like this thick booklet. It was like a, you know, it was like a law in Congress or something. And the only thing you knew when you finished your business plan is that like nothing would go the way you wrote it. You know, you knew it was already wrong. You just didn't know how wrong it was. Hopefully it was wrong on the downside, right? But most business plans were way too optimistic, wrong on the upside. The difference is now with the business model is you are proving out a business model. You are proving traction within a model that delivers a service or a product to customers. It proves up traction so that you know the business can scale or that the pain or need is out in customers. Does that make sense? So it's a difference and it's great. Anyways, won the business plan competition 14 years ago, uh, scaled that business and when I was, do we have any 25 year olds in the room? Raise your hand if you're 25. So we have like 10, 15, 20. When I was 25 years old, I was sitting across the table from a NASDAQ CEO, Harvard MBA, like 55 year old, and I was negotiating the sale of my business that I started, my tech business, to a NASDAQ listed company. And I was audacious enough to believe that I could do that, um, which I think is something to take from what I'm saying. You, as an entrepreneur, you have to be audacious. The only thing, you know, there's like, there's been a lot of studies. People have tried to find out what makes an entrepreneur great. What blah, 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 blah. You know, I think entrepreneurs can be any, be any shape, size, anything. I don't think there is a stamp of the entrepreneur. However, a thing that I think spans all entrepreneurs is kind of an irrational belief in themselves. <laughs> they think they can do things that most people think they can't. And this is an example of that. I was 25 years old. I was your guy's age sitting across the table like saying, let's go Harvard MBA, 50 year old CEO of this NASDAQ firm. I can go toe to toe with you and sell my business. Now, 
You probably can understand who won that negotiation. I did not win that negotiation, but it was a fine exit for a young 25-year-old kid, and I learned a ton. So I wouldn't change it. It was a good, it was a good exit uh, for me. And that started kind of my path in serious entrepreneurship. I had kind of always been an entrepreneur growing up, but that started my path in kind of serious entrepreneurship. So I'm going to share some thoughts with you. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my story, but that's kind of the background. I'm going to share some thoughts with you today. Again, I'd love to discuss them. Um, I own a firm called Peak Capital Partners. I started with two partners, and we own, we own a, over a billion dollars of real estate. And Shauna said that there haven't been a lot of real estate maybe in uh, entrepreneurs that have spoken here. So I could talk about a lot of things, but I want to talk, one of the things I want to talk about is real estate. So just so you know. Does anyone know the village it's at BYU, the village at South Campus? So I, we own the village. That's the closest um, asset that we own here to you guys, if you've ever been there. It's a cool place. We have about 1,000 BYU students there. But we own 80 complexes like that across the country. <clears throat> so a couple thoughts. You guys are here. You guys are learning. You're in school. I like this quote by Albert Einstein. Education is what remains after one has forgotten what one has learned in school. And this is super critical in the uh, environment that you're living in and growing up in and in the economy that you're going to graduate into. Okay? This kind of goes hand in hand with this thought. In today's world, the imperative to learn cannot be overstated. So what you guys need to ask yourself is learning part of your DNA because I, I hate to break it to you. I know most of you know this. Like, this is just the beginning of your learning. Like, UVU is not the end of your learning. The biggest thing that you can do here at UVU is learn how to learn. Does that make sense? Learn how to learn quickly. Learn how to improve quickly. Learn how to get better faster. Because speed is a part of our economy. With, with uh, data and technology, speed has never been so important. <sighs> So the, guy, the, the, the men and women that are winning in the workforce and winning in a, as entrepreneurs, I think, know how to learn. And they aren't afraid of it. And they keep learning. Like every day I'm learning. To be honest with you, this is why I'm an entrepreneur. Like if someone asked me, Jeff, why are you an entrepreneur? It's not to make a ton of money, although that can be a byproduct and that can be good if you use it for good. It can also be bad, by the way, if it kind of ruins you or ruins your character. But money can be good. You know, you can win awards and blah, 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 different things, which maybe are good. But why I'm really an entrepreneur is because every day I'm challenged. I couldn't think of another profession that would challenge me like entrepreneurship does every day. And it's around this idea of like learning every day because the world is constantly shifting, economies are shifting, um, and it's just a constant learning process. It's a real challenge. It's really hard to be honest with you. It's humbling for me because I don't, it's just hard. It's always learning. So this is good. Another thought. Skills pay the bills, never more true than now. So real skills are the currency of the new economy. So I was a communications undergrad at BYU. What hard skills did I have? I, I won't say any, I don't know what hard skills I had as a communications undergrad, but that was okay. I had other skills that I had learned in practice, like through entrepreneurship that mattered. And this is what matters guys. And girls, skills pay the bills. If you can sell, that's a skill, period. If you can program or code, that's a skill that you can bank on, period. Both those things are in demand, right? And there's a lot of other things that are in demand as well. So again, make sure that learning is part of your DNA and that you're focusing on skills, like real hard skills that can be um, applied in many different situations. Questions or thoughts to this point? Yeah. Uh, I think that's a great question. So the question is, can you hear me, by the way, on this mic? Is this right? Um, what, so the question was, what are the most important skills? I am biased towards soft skills first. What I mean by that is like character, just moral character. I can't do business with people I don't trust. 
I can't do business with people that so the, taking the soft skills aside, I just want to put that plug out there that like who you're becoming through this education at UVU in life is more important than these hard skills, honestly. They're more important to your family or future family. They're more important to your employer or future employer, the kind of person you are. If you can communicate effectively, if you're honest, if you get stuff done, actually work. So. Those are the most important skills. But so take that aside. My two favorite are the ones I just said, sales and uh, programming or coding, like technical ability. Those are my two favorite. Those are two, I think, bankable skills that you can go out into the workforce and be com confident that either you can sell, because there's a lot of companies around here that need to sell a lot of things, or that you can program or code or add a lot of value on the technology side. There's not. I mean, every company here, I know them because I own a venture fund as well. Uh, it's called Peak Ventures. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. It's the, it's the only and the first venture fund in Utah County. Uh, I'm funding tech startups like monthly or weekly, and they, none of them can find enough technical people to help good technical people. So those are my two favorite, but there are others. Qu other questions or thoughts? Okay, let's talk about real estate. And it, so Peak has grown kind of large and I've told you about it, but I wanna tell you about the beginning of Peak. Um, so let's see, yeah, so this is a picture of the village. This is a picture of Meadowbrook Station. We own this asset in Salt Lake. We own about 10 assets like this in Utah. And like I said, about 80 across the country. In the beginning of Peak though, um, I had sold my technology business, like I told you guys in 03. And I took the proceeds of that and rolled them into real estate. Again, in 03, you guys were like 10 years old or whatever, but that was a really good time to go into real estate. I don't know if you remember or heard your parents or talked to your parents about the good old days, like real estate was super hot. And I spun my money two, three times. And what ended up happening is I got really scared actually, because there was like this irrational exuberance around real estate. Do you remember this, Shauna? Like no one could lose in real estate. Everyone was a real estate entrepreneur or investor. Land in like nowhere Utah was worth a, a million dollars. You know, I mean, it was crazy. That's what it was like though. And by the way, when you see a market like that, like be fearful. Don't be like running towards that market with everyone else off the cliff. Like be fearful and cautious. One of the reasons I've had success is I've been kind of a contrarian investor or entrepreneur. Does that make sense? So when the crowds, I scaled my business through my technology business through 9-11, 2001. Um, that was a bad time in tech. That's when I grew my tech business. I grew my real estate business in 07, 08, 9, 10, when everyone was scared to death about real estate. Um, so I was a personal investor doing really good. And what scared me though, was this irrational exuberance around real estate. And so I sold, I sold seven of the eight assets I owned. And I say that because I just sold one like six months ago that I lost money at. It was, I don't know if I should say this, but it was um, land on a Jack Nicholas golf course in Austin, Texas, lost money. But the seven, the other assets I sold brought my money home looked around to, for good partners in real estate and brought two guys back here to Utah. I was kind of, kind of stuck here um, with a service assignment that I couldn't leave. And uh, so I brought them here to start Peak. And we bought, and our thesis was to buy a bunch of distressed real estate um, when things stopped. So when we started, so does that make sense? Sorry, I'm kind of just throwing out random stories and ideas. I hope you're catching some of this and some of it's meaningful. When we started, it was the three of us like in a 10 by 10 office, like back to back. My two partners are Ivy League MBAs. Um, I had sold my tech company, but we bootstrapped the first couple years really hard. It was the three of us in a small office. One of my partners, again, he's an Ivy League MBA, moved in with his in-laws because we had, were running out of money uh, we were really lean and mean. We kind of pre-timed it. We, we kind of started ramping up 
before things had worked out in the financial system so that we could buy. So we bootstrapped it and we're really lean and mean and, we, and there's a lot to be learned by bootstrapping. You guys understand the difference between bootstrapping and taking money, right? Bootstrapping, I think, instills in an entrepreneur what I would just call this character that can't be beat. There's a part of bootstrapping that's really important and really good. And in the entrepreneurs I now back, I love to see some of that grit, that scrappiness that comes from bootstrapping it. So that's how it was. What happened is the economy eventually started, the financial system kind of started eventually thawing out or loosening up. And so we bought a lot. We bought probably like $1.2 billion worth of real estate in the last five years. And we've invested about uh, 300 million in equity. Uh, we are large investors in every deal we do, but then we have in other outside investors that we have bought this portfolio with. So we're over a billion in asset value. We own 80 properties in 22 states. We are named uh, Utah's second fastest growing business over the last five years, last year by the Mountain West Capital Network. We were named to the Inc. 500 list which usually is like kind of tech startup-y things, but we were there as real estate. And you guys have maybe seen the village. These are my partners, Jamie and Jeff. Let me just say something about partners real quick that I think is important. Um, any questions about that, first of all? Let me say something about partners. I often get the question like, should I have partners in business? Like I have this idea, should I bring a partner? Here are my, t and my answer is yes. Now, I was a high school and actually a college athlete. I played uh, college basketball, if you can believe it, as a short point guard. I love basketball, and my boys now play basketball. Um, I have four young children. And so I like, I'm kind of biased towards that team dynamic, but I really believe in that kind of the, the whole can be greater than the sum of the parts if you put them together the right way. So I like partners. Entrepreneurship can be a lonely road. It can be a long road. And if, I don't know, if, if you're alone, you just got to have like nerves of steel and just be the grittiest person ever because it is long. You kind of sometimes need a shoulder to cry on. You need a partner to bounce ideas off of. So I like partners. So that's my answer to if you should have partners. I believe in partners. Now let me, I'll grab your question. Let me say two things that I tell people when they say, well, how do I know who's a good partner? Here are the two things. Number one, your partner has to have the same baseline ethics, morals, or whatever than you. They don't have to go to the same church as you. That's not what I'm saying. That they have to be, if you believe in being trustworthy, if you want to do business the right way, if you believe in working hard, they've got to be cut from that same cloth. Does that make sense? So they can be as different than you as anything, but they got to have that same kind of DNA that you do. You've got to just have that same baseline uh, kind of understanding of maybe work ethic and morals, etc. So that's one. But then secondly, you've got to be self-aware enough to grab, you've got to be self-aware enough of knowing where you're good at and maybe where you're not as strong. And then you want to rally in partners that complement where you're weak, right? So you need to understand your skills. You need to understand what you're good at. You need to understand what you struggle with or aren't as good at. And then you need to rally partners to your side that complement your weaknesses. Does that make sense? So maybe like in my first business, I had a partner who was really good at technology, but he wasn't that good at business or sales. So I filled that role, right? Uh, I'm not the best at details. I'm good at big vision and strategy and like entrepreneurship. My two partners at Peak are really good at like the details and the numbers and just different things than me. We're a great... Uh, compliment and partnership. We've been together now for eight years. I was skiing. Uh, we owned Powder Mountain for a time. Has anyone been to Powder Mountain and skied? It's awesome up Ogden Canyon. We owned, we bought Powder Mountain in like 07, owned it for like three years. We love it. I was up there skiing with one of my partners yesterday for President's Day. We were talking about our journey. You're going to have a long winding journey in entrepreneurship and you've got to make sure that you have partners though that kind of share your same baseline ethics or morals. Now, how did you find your partner? Um, my, my first partner in my first business lived in the same apartment complex I did. So just we were lived by each other. 
these guys, does this have a pointer? It does? Oh, yeah. So let's see. This guy was my best buddy in undergrad. So the connections you're making it right now can be really important for you. Because we're doing, you know, we're building million, tens of million dollar businesses together. And we were just two really poor guys together at BYU. We ran the management consulting club together at BYU in the, in the Marriott School. So my senior year, I was go, finishing school, running my startup, and flying around the country with this guy. His name is Jamie Dunn, interviewing with like Bain and McKinsey and stuff like that. And then Jamie and Jeff met at, uh, they met at, at uh, MBA school. So Jamie went to Wharton, Jeff went to Tuck, Dartmouth, and they met at some networking. It was an LDS networking like event for Ivy League business people. And so I was talking to Jamie about these ideas that I had in real estate. Again, this is in 06. And he said, hey, you got to meet Jeff. Like I met him at business school. Great guy. He loves real estate. He's having some of our same thoughts. So Jeff flew out here. It was almost exactly like nine years ago right now. And we had lunch at Thanksgiving Point. We were meeting about a real estate deal. But shortly after we had been talking for 15 or 20 minutes, I said, hey, what I really want to do is start like a firm and buy a bunch of real estate when things pull back. So anyways, that's how I met my partners. It's about relationships, right? And one of the things, again, this isn't in the slide deck uh, and it doesn't matter, but here's just a thought for you. When I was your age, at least, I just um, like you take the long view in life. I thought like I had to make a million dollars like right away or I was, it was over. I, I don't know. I was too, I just had too fast of thinking. And because of that, I wasn't the best business partner like originally. I just, because I was too much of a driver and just not understanding of my partner. The point is, I think our careers are longer than maybe you think. Again, I'm 37 years old. I graduated from undergrad in 01, so 14 years ago. And I still, I don't know, I still think I'm young. Like, I still think I'm just getting started, but it's been a longer journey than I could understand when I was in your seats. So the point is, take the long view. And the most important place to take the long view is in relationships. So if you nurture good relationships like this, they will, you know, come back and pay you back over again and again and again and again. Other thoughts, questions? I don't even know what's next. I have not looked at this, to be honest with you. Okay, so now, okay, so now I'm going to talk about Peak Ventures, a venture fund, which is what I'm focused on now and I'm excited about, but I don't want to leave this real estate. Do you guys understand how private equity works? Do you want me to tell you how private equity works? Is it interesting? Obviously, Mitt, Ram, Mitt Romney ran for president, uh, whatever, last time, and is there a, can I get a marker? Um, and, you know, private equity was in the news a lot and kind of like bad private equity. Private equity, what does that mean? What is private equity? It means not a public company. Yeah, it just means our money. Like, it's all our private money being pulled together and hopefully doing better deals than we could do alone, right? I assume that in this room, if, if we pulled our money together, we would have access to all different deals. You guys are from all different places. You have different experience and expertise. If it's run by a... <coughs> a trustworthy and good fund manager, theoretically, we should all do better together, right? We should do the best deals that all of us have. That's what private equity is. And um, that's what our real estate firm is, right? It's a real estate private equity firm. So we've used investor capital to go in and to buy these assets. Now, we invest alongside our investors, and we buy these assets. What happens is all the investor money comes back, so again, let's just use a simple numbers and a simple idea. Let's say you invested $100 in one of our projects. $100 would come back plus a preferred return. Does anyone know what that is? It's like an intro, it's a preferred return on that capital. So let's say the preferred, again, I'm using simple math. Let's say the preferred return was 10%. So after, and let's say you invested $100. And let's say we sold the asset in a year. Again, is, is everyone following me so far? Simple. Thank you so much. 
then you would get back $110, right? Because you get $100 back, then your preferred return of 10%. And then every dollar after that is split, and this is just a typical waterfall structure, split 80 cents to you and then 20 to the LP or investor and 20 cents to the GP or the guy who put the deal together. Does that make sense? So that's, that's a typical private equity structure. Now, again, in real estate private equity. Now, there's different nuance with that. Like, you know, the preferred return might not be 10. It might be 5. It might be 15. The split on the back end, excuse me, may be 30 and not 20. But a standard structure is a preferred return back and then an 80-20 split. 80 to the investor and 20% to the GP. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, question. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was about how we found our initial investors, you mean in, in peak capital, right? Yeah. Again, it's just all about relationships. I had been in the community. I had had some success through selling my first business. I um, am part of the entrepreneurial founders group at BYU. Um, I had all these relationships. And so it was just wealthy entrepreneurs that I knew that believed in me that I said, hey, I think there's going to be a real estate pullback and hey, I think the best risk adjusted returns for the next decade, again, remember this is in 06 or 07, so we're almost done with that decade, but are going to be found in real estate. I'm willing to invest my own money alongside of you, but I don't have enough money to do it all on my own. Do you want to invest with me and buy these assets? So it was just relationships, right? And at first it was really hard. Like I would you know, I would basically meet with people and no, 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 yes, no, yes. You know, I mean, it was really hard. Now, and after you establish a track record of success, I would say that <coughs> we're probably sitting on right now $50 million that we can't even deploy. We can't find enough good deals for all the investor demand we have. So it's flipped after you've established a track record. But at first, it's really hard. One of the things I say to entrepreneurs you know, like the stock prospectus you get, which says like no pa future past results or no indicator of future results or whatever. In my opinion, for entrepreneurs, the best indicator of future success is past success. So past success is an indicator of future success with entrepreneurs. So build your little wins, right? I don't care what your business is right now, build it, make it a win, and then go on to the next, you know what I mean? Build your track record of success. That doesn't mean if you have a mistake or, because all entrepreneurs make mistakes and have bad deals, but you kind of are building your track record of success, and then it becomes easier to raise money. Does that make sense? When does this class end? When are we done? 12.50. 12.50, okay. Other questions about real estate or else I'm gonna move on. Yeah. Well, again, the way that we were affected is we had just started. We had, were in our little office together. We were ready to go, and we knew it was not the right time to go. So what happened was we literally had no revenue in our business for 24 to 36 months, two to three years. And so what happened is my partner moved in with his in-laws. He's an Ivy League MBA, you know, young 30s, moving in with his in-laws. There are other things, so we just had to bide our time. Now, that was really hard during that time, but again, this is kind of uh, an illustration of taking the long view. We had to just be patient then, and it was hard then. But what, when we told investors who were trying to give us money, no, it's not a good time to invest, what do you think happened when we went back to them and say, hey, now's a good time to invest? Instead of investing a million dollars, like they literally said, no, invest my million dollars, and that seemed like a lot of money to us then. When we said no, we could easily, but we just don't think it's the right time. When we went back like 12 months later and said, okay, I think it's the right time now, they literally invested $10 million. What were the factors that played in you knowing that it wasn't the right time? I mean, in 08, 09, it was pretty obvious, like at that time. I mean, it wasn't obvious at the beginning. Cycles are interesting, you know, like... You just don't know where you are in the economic cycle, except when you're in the, maybe at the very top, you have an indication when you're at the very bottom, you know, like it can't get worse than this or 
like all banking is just going to freeze up. That's really how bad it was in 08, 09. So you just knew it was, you knew it was the bottom. Now, how to tell where you are like in the wave? No one is perfect and no one knows exactly. But again, a good indication for me is when people love things, that gets me nervous. For instance, I started a venture fund, right? I'm actually a little nervous about the timing of this venture fund because everyone is really hot on venture right now. Now, I happen to believe that we live in an inter a unique place for venture because there was no other seed fund in Utah County and there's a lot of good entrepreneurs and opportunities here. So I think we're insulated from that a little, but it still makes me nervous because venture is really hot, right? So anyways, that, that's my best indication is like when everyone loves something, I'm kind of like, I, I'm not sure if I love that or that makes me nervous. Why does everyone love that? Good questions. Any other questions about real estate or what I've said? Shauna. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I read a lot of books. So like the hard thing about hard things, you should read that in entrepreneurship. Um, I'm reading a book right now about essentialism. I can't remember the author. So, author, sorry. So I read a lot of books. I'm reading a book about happiness, the how of happiness or the why of happiness, one of those. So I just read a lot. Um, and then honestly, my favorite social media by far is Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter I, just because so you get a totally kind of, obviously there's some ads in there, but you get a, I follow every top VC in the Bay Area. I follow TechCrunch, right? I follow the startups here in Utah I'm interested in, the CEOs in Utah I'm interested in. I use Twitter a lot and I like Twitter. I try to, I'm not great because I'm busy, but every night I try to just scroll through Twitter and I probably end up clicking on five or six articles that I read or skim and, and they're just from the, the places that you would think of, you know, TechCrunch and Forbes and just all the nothing serious. But anyways, I would say those are my main two things. I read, read a lot of books and then I spend time on Twitter. They're kind of different approaches, right? Books are kind of a longer term investment thinking. Twitter's just like what's happening now, what's hot, what are people talking about? Um, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess I don't believe in a big break. There's, there's big breaks or breaks like every day or every week or every month. Like you kind of, I don't believe in a big break and I still don't believe I've made it. I mean, I have maybe by entrepreneurship or world standards or maybe what you guys think, but I don't feel that way. I feel, still feel like the underdog. I still have a chip on my shoulder. I still will work hard to be the best at what I do. And I think creating that hunger or that desire, that's the character I'm kind of talking about, is just critical to your success. So I don't feel like I've made it. And, and I don't think there's a single, I could tell you literally like, I don't know, 50 stories, seriously, over the last 15 years. So what is that, three or four a year that are like really important. Like this is, I remember in my first tech startup, um, we had our first opportunities for a six figure deal. So it was like a hundred and something thousand dollars deal, which was a big deal for us as 25 year old kids. We had a little office, Sean, I don't know if you ever went there, but it was right across from New Skin at the old Provo Pharmacy. Anyways. Yeah, it was a cool loft in Provo, but old, we had literally like mighty light folding desks, right? You know, chairs like this. This company, you know, it was a big deal, $150,000 deal or something was like, oh, by the way, yeah, we think we're leaning towards you. We thought they were gonna like sign and we were ready to go and, you know, and they called and said, we're gonna come out and visit you tomorrow. And we were like, okay, great. You know, we hung up the phone, literally like my partner and I went to RC Willie, which we thought was nice then or whatever, or somewhere like that. We bought like 
$20,000 worth of furniture, moved it into our place. The people came in and, oh yeah, this looks nice. We met for a couple hours. We won the deal. They left. We literally moved that furniture right out like that day or the next day. That's a true story, a true, true story. So I don't know, there's a story from 15 years ago that was really important because we were doing like ten to $30,000 engagements, then we just did a hundred and twenty or $50,000 engagement. That's an interesting story that was a make, but those happen like quarterly. I feel like I'm dealing with those like now still. So it's not one, it's not one whatever, and I still don't feel like I've arrived, and I certainly haven't arrived <clears throat> in the most important aspects of my life, which isn't being a businessman or an entrepreneur, although that's really important to me. It, being a dad and a husband and a good person, I, I don't think you ever really arrive there, and so I'm still working on that. You just gotta always work. So I feel like I've heard a number of like special entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs like yourself speak, and I always just wondered like, you said you were talking about, I guess my question is similar. You were sitting in a small office and you had no revenue coming in. Like, how does somebody go from like, like I don't think I could go right, do my job right now and pursue my dream because I was living in an information world. Like, I, how did you do that? Yeah, my, every situation's different. This is kind of some of the bootstrap and grit I'm talking about. And again, I, I would never, you should, yeah, anyways, that's kind of some of what I'm talking about. My personal situation was I was married, recently married, and my wife was a year ahead of me in school and had graduated and was a second grade teacher. And we were rich because she made like two grand a month uh, as a teacher. I was a senior at BYU. And so I, I literally remember driving across. I had a really cool internship at Dallas, Texas the summer before my senior year. I remember driving, my wife had to leave me. I remember our first anniversary, I ate like steak on the company that I worked with by myself, literally in Albuquerque, New Mexico and called my wife. She was eating like top ramen at our little apartment at BYU because she was here teaching already. And I said, I remember saying to her, literally, I'm eating steak, she's eating ramen. And I'm like, I, I think this year is a good year for me to try to start something because if you know you're making a little bit of money so anyway so so we lived off her her she only taught for a year because she, we had our first son um, but she so that was our story but it was scary like when I did my startup we started in August and we didn't ever myself or my founder never took a penny until May so what is that 10 months or nine months so I, there's no easy answers to that one. I mean, I don't, I don't, it's very difficult, but that's the joy of entrepreneurship. Risk is like a two-sided coin, like, or opportunity and risk are like two sides of a coin. Like you cannot have big opportunity without taking risk. You have to take risk to have the big opportunity. Um, and by the way, and it's not, yeah, so anyways. If you're not comfortable in entrepreneurship, by the way, you shouldn't do it. I mean, like if you don't believe that you can do it, maybe comfortable is the wrong word because entrepreneurship I don't think is ever really comfortable. But if you're just like not confident, don't do it, you know? Like you've got to breathe and live this to make it work, I think. Like it's got to be your mission or it's probably not going to work. And you'll probably end up in a hard spot because you'll lose money or whatever. So anyways, hopefully this advice is good. Is this good? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Something like I don't know what. Ninety-nine percent of businesses are just improvements on other businesses. They're not necessarily even new or novel ideas. Some of the ones we hear about are right, but most businesses are just. There are a lot of real estate, private equity firms. There's a lot of people that own apartments. We just have done it in a good way, right? So. I think it's just being aware of the macroeconomic cycle, which again, I feel a lot more comfortable with now as a 37 year old than I did 15 years ago in undergrad. But I'm still, you know, so being aware of kind of the macroeconomic cycle 
And then just, yeah, needs that you see or hear about amongst your peers at UVU or in Orem or Provo or wherever you live, just being aware of those kind of needs and then saying, huh, you know, like, that makes sense. Maybe that's something someone would buy. Then you test it, get some traction. If it looks good, then you go in, right? But you don't go in until you, like, have validated the idea and the pain. Um, What's the best way you found to... I mean, I'm going to give you a broad answer, but I'm, it is the best sweat, just work, hustle, hustle. So I don't, you just got to get, I don't, you know, like, I don't care, just pure hustle. That is the best way to test an idea. Uh, if you have to stand out here and talk to students as they walk by, if you have to go knock doors and validate with apartment owner, you know, I don't care what you have to do, just hustle. Like, that is the best way. You know, be ingenious and just hustle. Okay, so let me wrap up. I think we have like five more minutes. So now we have a venture fund. It's called Peak Ventures. This is really what I love. This is what I'm spending. We have a couple hundred employees now at Peak Capital, the apartment fund or group. And so what I love is, is venture startups. So we launched a $23 million fund last year. Some of you may know Paul Allen, the founder of Ancestry.com. Um, he wrote a blog post that I think, you know, this may not seem like a big deal to some of you, a small $23 million fund um, amongst all the big ones in Silicon Valley. But for startups in Utah, this is huge news. If even a single startup funded by Peak Ventures follows the path of billion-dollar Utah companies such as Omniture, Vivint, Ancestry, Inside Sales, or Qualtrics, the ripple effects will boost the economy and entrepreneurship for years to come. So what's fueling me now is basically, honestly investing my money in you guys or in the new crop of entrepreneurs, the new Jeff Burningham's, the new and better version of me that are going to take it to new heights and do really cool things. That's why I started a venture fund. Here are some of the deals we've invested in. Have, you, have any of you guys heard of any of these companies? Anyways, you should look them up. They're all, most of them are local. Studio is a really cool app. You should download it now. For design, it's bringing design to the masses. Toot Genomics is in downtown Provo. It's about reading, it's about big data, reading thousands of genomes, like our human genomes, and then providing that data to big pharmaceutical companies to see trends and risk factors and things like that. Super interesting. Uh, anyway, and I could talk about all these forever, but. Um, we host a lot of events. This is my partner, by the way. Sid Cromenhook is his name. He started a company here locally called Zinch. It was an ed tech company that he sold to a, a publicly traded company in the Bay Area called Chegg. But it's Sid and I. So it's Sid and I, and then we have a team of three other principals in the fund. Oh, we've done stuff with all these guys, if you've heard of any of this. Um, here's a little overview of the fund. Here's the deals by state and industry. So I'll wrap up with this and then see if there's any ending questions. So White Peak Ventures and Entrepreneurship in Utah now. Guys, when I started my business 14 years ago, my first tech company, the resources that you guys have, I mean, it's like a hundred times. You guys have a hundred times the resources that I had even 14 years ago. Um, there were a couple of kind of angels and people that would help like Shauna and that was it, but very few. So this is a great time to be an entrepreneur. The reason that I'm doing entrepreneurship in, in Utah right now is because of kind of a personal mission, like I told you, but from a bit, the business case is this, we own a building in the river woods where we office. It's a little three story building. We're on the top floor. Um, Across from us are three billion dollar tech companies. Ancestry, Vivint right across, and then Qualtrics. There's another billion dollar tech company just south of here called Inside Sales. There is a one just north of here called Domo. You probably have heard of some of these businesses. That did not exist in Utah 14 years ago. So here's what that means. What that means is when these companies have exits or create liquidity for their partners or the, the employees, that is just more um, 
capital into the economy that's never been here before, number one. Number two, they are attracting talent to Utah that have never been here before. And same with us, even at peak. The last several hires we've made at peak have been very high level people from out of state, not of the predominant religion, not um, very smart, good backgrounds. And so that talent, those are people for you guys to partner with, right? So there's increasingly diverse talent here, number two. Number three, obviously there's a young, vibrant student base between UVU and BYU, smart, sharp students that are hungry and scrappy for themselves. So, and there's a lack of capital. There is not a, there hasn't been, we're the first Utah County venture fund. So for those reasons, uh, we're doing peak ventures and doing it in the state of Utah. There's a couple other ideas I have here. I won't share them, um, but I'll just end with this. Clayton Christensen, you guys have heard of him, I'm sure. I was kind of a reluctant, this is a la my last thought, and then we'll see if there's one last question. I was kind of a reluctant entrepreneur. I always thought entrepreneurs were kind of like um, just money hungry guys that wanted fame. What I've come to learn over my 15 years of being an entrepreneur and employing hundreds of people is that if done well, management is among the most noble professions. Like providing jobs for families and providing a good environment is super rewarding and super fun. So in all of your entrepreneurial uh, adventures, always take the long view and remember that it's not about the money, it's not about the awards or the fame or whatever, it's about blessing other people's lives. That's really the point of life and the point of entrepreneurship, which is why I like it. And that's all I have to say today, thanks.